Okay, so uh, we're now going to um, have the wonderful um, Laura. <coughs> Laura, uh, Laura McBrown is uh, the managing director of GB Electronics, uh, a manufacturing business, and uh, she's won awards, more awards than you care to mention. She's a representative at Made UK. She's won awards at Made UK. She speaks there. Laura, the floor is yours. Hi, good morning, everybody. Tough act or couple of acts to follow this morning. Um, as Richard said, I'm Laura from GB Electronics. We're a manufacturing business. I'm proud to share that we have diversity of 50 50 men and women. I'm even more proud to share that our leadership team is also 50-50 men and women. That's um, quite an achievement in our sector because we are engineering and management. And so people often ask me how it is that we have achieved this result. And in all honesty, I wasn't really sure. It wasn't ever something we set out to try and achieve. Um, But, you know, all accidents have a cause. So the more we thought about it, we realised that um, a lot of it was to do with... um, our um, inclusive leadership style. So um, we, sorry, excuse me. Um, So we looked at what we'd done differently. So in order for me to sort of explain how it is that we got to this point, it's going to be necessary for me to go back a few years. So um, if you are all sitting comfortably, I'll begin. Once upon a time, there was an amazing man my father started a family business. He worked early in the morning till late at night, um, dealing with every opportunity, inquiry, problem, issue, everything that came his way. Um, he was so engrossed in his work um, that he neglected his loyal and um, dedicated workforce. And as the years went by, they became more and more disconnected from him and um, a culture of blame set into the company. Um, By the time my father retired, this culture had become deep-seated and the staff were disengaged. So my um, sister and I took over the business. (laughs) Um, And it was our job to to bring that that business forward. We recognised that we weren't going to do anything different, but we needed to do things differently. We recognised that we couldn't fill our father's shoes in the same way that he had. I didn't have the skill set, the knowledge, the engineering background at the same level that he has. And so it was important for us to engage with all of the team to make sure that we used their knowledge and we built the business coming forward together. So as all good IOD directors know, failing to plan is planning to fail. So we put together our vision for the future, our mission statements as to how we were going to get there, um, and our values as to how we were going to do this, and we launched Team GMB as our culture. So very proud of ourselves. We launched into smart objectives and um, rolling out, you know, what it is that we felt that we were going to do. Success? <laughs> no. <laughs> um, sadly, we recognised that um, the autocratic style of management that we had come from, going to smart objectives in one step was just a step too far. It was too much to expect everyone to do in one go. So we recognised that we needed to just wind it back a step, take things a bit more slowly, and work with the team to come up with something that was a bit more clear in terms of what we were trying to achieve. So um, in, um, uh, in collaboration with our management team and our supervisor team, we come up with, I recognise you can't see this, but you'll get the idea, We came up with sort of 12 objectives that we felt um, were key to delivering manufacturing excellence. And then we sat down and we described what we felt at stage four would be the key sort of, you know, outcome, what the picture looked like, very much described, you know, how it was going to look when it was complete. Stage one, very much, you know, what we felt poor looked like and a couple of steps in between. So what that meant was that Um, When we then sat down with the supervisors and the management team, they essentially had a menu that they could choose from. Each department sort of scores where they think they are on this journey, whether it's um, on-time delivery performance, process capability, 
productivity improvements, training, communication. Um, and they can choose a, a project that they work with um, individually in their department or they can do something as a team. So um, that, very, that, that started to work well and our team culture was starting to embed. We had to show that we were not just talking the talk, we were sh needed to show that we were walking the walk as well. It was important that they could see that we were prepared to invest time in listening to what it was that they had to say. Um, and so then taking them on other factory visits, taking time out of the business, getting them to see how other companies do things. We had a team of people that had been there really since they'd left school and so um, they needed to, to get out and, and see how other companies did things. And also it helped them to recognise that actually what they were doing really maybe wasn't as bad as they had thought. So it gave them that confidence that what they were doing was, was good. Um, one of the key um, um, values that we introduced is um, a learning culture. And so um, what we also included in that is learning by our mistakes. So we, had, um, we monitor our cost of quality, most manufacturing businesses do, and that includes our cost of any scrap, cost of any rework, warranty customer returns. So um, previously when um, we had any issues come in, our quality manager would sit down, decide what it he was that he thought we ought to do differently, rewrite a procedure and go and train that team with the hope that that would solve the issue. And sometimes it did. And sometimes we had the same issue or similar <coughs> issue with another customer in the future. So what we wanted to try and do was use inclusion to get everybody involved in dealing with those issues. Um, so we introduced quality circles. And so our quality manager would um, pick you know, what is maybe our biggest cost of quality for that period. And everyone who had been involved in that um, project or something to do with what had resulted in that cost of quality would be invited to a meeting. So clearly with our blame culture, this had the um, potential to end badly. So I made sure that I attended all of those first meetings to say, if it's, you know, if you know who created this problem or it was you, I want you to keep it to yourself. It's not important. That's not why we're here. We're not here to attribute blame and point fingers. If one person has made that mistake, then it's quite possible, based on the information that we've given you, that anybody else could make the same mistake. So it's important that we understand how we've come to this point and that we collectively um, come up with a solution for how we can mitigate it in the future. And so once they were given that sort of freedom to, to talk and share their ideas, the value of information that we got back was far more useful and comprehensive than anything that one person can do from a different department sitting at a, a desk on their own. So our team G&B was starting to embed. People were starting to believe us. It was it born out of the culture that, again, Kate and I couldn't do what our father had done in the way that he'd done it. So it was important that you know, we brought that whole team with us to move forward. We needed to show that we had um, inclusion and diversity was um, something that we were growing and actively trying to pursue within the business. And much as I'm against you know, um, positive discrimination, it's important that we get the right team around us. My job is to make sure that we have those conversations and I recognise that we have a better quality of conversation from a more diverse group. So it's important that most of our departments have um, a mixture of men and women um, and ages and we have within the business tried to promote from within um, to make sure that the knowledge and skills from other departments are crossed over as well. Sadly today I haven't got time to share all of our stories but I have picked a handful I don't have time to share Lee's story about his journey from being in packing to customer service, Sally's journey from the shop floor to um, being our chief inspector, um, Richard's journey from being our, one of our supervisors to our head of operations, Chris's journey to being our lead supervisor for our manual assembly department, or Renata's journey from shop floor to purchasing. So I've had to choose carefully this morning. This is Kim. Um, as we were getting to know the team more and we were having more open conversations, we started to recognise that the team were opening up to us 
they were sharing more about them. We were getting to know them on a deeper level. And it came to light that Kim had um, previously run her own business selling printed circuit boards. Um, she, but she no longer wanted to do that. Her business had failed for non-payment of, by one of her clients. Um, and she no longer wanted to spend her time on the road. She'd been working for us for about seven years doing administration. Um, and we sort of didn't really know any of this about Kim. One of our um, mission statements is to deliver exceptional customer service. So we recognised that we needed a customer service team and we were going to need someone to head up that team. We needed somebody that knew the business, that understood the customers, that understood how our business works and the team that we had. And so when recruiting for that role, because of our knowledge of the, customer, of the team that we now have, we recognised that we had the perfect person under our nose. So the benefits to us is that, you know, when I see my clients, they'll tell me, you know, what a fantastic service, we're their number one supplier, we're the most proactive at coming back to them with queries when they, you know, when they need to know what the status of their job is. Um, they'll tell us that, um, you know, the, the team that she's developing is doing the same thing. And if I talk to, to Kim about how she feels about it, she feels like she's more back to her old self. She didn't think that she would have the confidence to do that kind of role again. But now that she's got it under the belt and she's developing her own team, she feels much more like her old successful self. And we're benefiting with you know, good customer service and the fact that her team are actively increasing our revenue by <coughs> driving more business through our existing customer base. This is James. James has been with the company since he left school. I think he joined us because his mum said that if he didn't um, go to college, he'd better come to work with her, and he joined us. <laughs> so, um, and he came in year after year, um, uh, running one of our production lines and programming some of the machinery we have. Was he um, gonna go anywhere? No, probably not. Was he motivated in what he was doing? Probably not really. Um, but my job, James is incredibly bright. Once we start to sort of unpick some of the layers and talk to him about what he was capable of, we recognised that he was wasted sitting in this little corner of our factory. Um, we started to talk to him about doing an HNC um, in electronics, and he was reluctant to sort of go ahead and, and do that. And so after a few months of um, some gentle teasing at any opportunity that presented itself, he finally came to talk to me about it, and his concerns were, you know, what, what if I fail? What if um, I waste the company's money? What if, you know, what if it doesn't work out? <coughs> what if I'm not up to it? And I said, look, James, the key thing with this is that you will learn something to benefit yourself, to benefit us as a business. Um, it really doesn't matter what the bit of paper says. He said, if you go and you show up and you do your best, then that's all I can ask of you, and I will see the benefits of what you're learning back here in the factory. So he agreed to go ahead and do the HNC. Um, so I, kept, I talked to him about you know, how he was getting on with it, and he did sort of confess to me that he was struggling with the maths element, going from GCSE maths in the 90s to engineering maths in single step several years later was quite a, a, an ask. So, I got one of the engineers that I know who does mentoring to spend some time with him um, doing, that, um, doing that extra maths curriculum work. And um, he passed the, the um, exams with flying colours. He stuck at it and he, he did really well. Now James heads up our engineering team. He has a team of six behind him. Um, and he couldn't be more motivated. There's nothing that I can't give him that I know that he won't get his head around and sort out. So it's a huge comfort for me to have someone like that as part of my team. This is Deborah. Deborah, um, anyone, anyone that ever tried to recruit an engineer will know how difficult that is. Um, there's not much coming into the industry and there's not many people that are um, keen to, to do it. But um, they are massively necessary, massively valued in the industry. And we were struggling to um, recruit an engineer into James's team. So we dug out some of our old 
CVs, pre-GDPR, whatever the rules are with that now. Um, and <laughs> 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 um, and uh, we, we identified that Debra ticked um, many of the boxes that we were you know, looking for in this engineering role. And going back to what you said earlier with regards to the fact that if she couldn't tick all the boxes, she didn't want to put her name forward for that. So we rang the recruiter to find out if she was still available. And um, he forwarded her the CV and said, you know, and she was like, oh, no, there's not much here. And, you know, there's things here that I can't do. I'm not sure that it's really for me. So the recruiter that we work with has known us for a lot of years. He, he understands that we have an inclusive and development kind of culture within the business. And he convinced her to um, come and have a coffee and helped her to recognise the value <coughs> of the things that she could offer rather than worrying too much about the things that she couldn't. I'm sure you've already guessed, Deborah joined our team and has been a massive um, asset to the team and also benefits from being part of James's team, someone that understands the value of having someone that believes in you. This is Tony. Um, well, I included him because um, I think with the, our inclusive approach, one of the other benefits that we've had is the fact that <coughs> the role that Tony now does is not something that we ever recruited for. It wasn't something that we recognised. But as we got to know Tony, we recognised that he had skills beyond what we had recruited him for. So he came in to put together our production folders and work instructions as to how the jobs should be put together. But the more we got to know him, the more we recognised that he had skills with databases <coughs> and Excel and lean training, which is how to do things more in efficiently, so to speak. And so um, we thought that actually he might make a good productivity specialist. Productivity is key in most businesses, but it's part of our strategy that I talked about earlier. And so it's really important that you know, we build on that moving forward. But our managers have got the jobs to get out, they've got the teams to manage, so to, for them to have the headspace to also do the development work to improve process can be quite a challenge. So to have someone within the business that they can give that problem to, often they know what they want, they know what they need, they know what data they want to measure, um, but to have someone that can go off and create the reports, work it all out, come up with different software solutions, so not just on the shop floor, but actually are there things in our administration team that we should be automating? So whether that is matching invoices using AI, or whether that is um, importing data into our system, or whether that's when we're doing estimating, rather than going online and looking everything up individually, we can automate that and pull all the data down from the websites that we use. So all of those things, he can spend the time working out rather than putting extra pressure on our managers. Um, so obviously there's a lot of benefits there that we've had as business, commercially and um, as part of the team. Um, one of the benefits that I recognise is that um, because the ownership of the strategy is with the team and they can come up with their own ideas, there's no pressure on me to try and make them do things that we need to do to improve. They're their ideas, they're driving them forward, and we benefit because it's something that they find would be useful when they're working at the cold frame. So we've been doing all of that, and we're sort of getting to the end of our last five-year plan, so which involved my father's retirement and us moving forward. And so... We're now starting to think about, well, what should we be doing next? So how can we continue <coughs> with our inclusivity? And what we decided to do, we're doing all this SWOT and PESTL, traditional sort of stuff and competitor analysis. Um, but we felt that what was really important was to understand with the team what they felt they needed. So we embarked on a journey to interview everybody, all 58 of the team that we have. We deliberately didn't set a time frame doing this. We wanted to make sure that we could get the maximum out of each session that we had. And um, we recognised that pulling up you know, one of the, the team from the shop floor to come and have an interview with two directors was going to take a little while to get them to sort of relax into that. So it was very informal. Just did it over coffee um, in my office, just having a, a chat about you know, what, what they do, what they spent a lot of their time doing, what they felt was a waste of their time, what they enjoyed what they didn't like so much, there's always someone that likes the thing that you hate, so if we can try and match that up a bit and think about what they like, that will help. 
um, what they would like more training in and how they would like to, to progress within the business. And I think if you're going to do this, one of the things that I would say was the top tip would be if someone sort of mentions like a throwaway comment, um, don't let it pass by. So we'd often get towards the end of the meeting and they'd say, oh, I'm just going back to do this, it's such a pain kind of thing. And I said, oh, yeah, tell me a bit more about that. And they said, oh, well, we've got to you know, wander from one end of the factory to the other end of the factory to do this and then carry everything back again. Things like that. And it was just, you know, by just going, oh, just being curious and just listening to what it is that they were actually doing um, was, you know, has been really useful. So the benefits of that, a little bit too early to tell. But I think that um, the key thing for me is that I now have a huge amount of data to select from. In fact, I think when we put it into a list, I think we have over 700 different opportunities for improvement. Be careful what you wish for. Right? <laughs> but I think there's a lot of commonality in there. And um, apart from anything else, that will help us to score what we should be working on first and who should be involved and how we should get it, um, project teams put together, and when we should you know, do these individual different, uh, different projects. And I think that when we roll this out, um, because the team know that they have been involved in creating it, I feel confident that they will be behind me in what it is that we are trying to achieve and that we will be on the same page. So I think I'm just going to finish with a challenge for you. So what can we all do today to help us reap the benefits of inclusivity tomorrow? Thank you.